Space Services Inc. was one of the first private rocket companies. Now, where did we leave off with them? Oh, right. In the wake of Percheron's explosion, David Hanna Jr. consulted with industry experts from NASA and the like on how to proceed with his commercial rocket ideas. One of those consultants was also God. I wonder what his certifications are. God et al. suggested Hanna go with a solid rocket. This, coupled with internal problems at his own company, got Gary Hudson to leave. Space Services Inc. brought in three other firms to help with their new design. Space Vector, Eagle Engineering, and DFVLR. Space Vector is a corporation that specializes in sounding rockets and other aerospace components. Eagle was made up of old NASA engineers, and DFVLR would do radar and telemetry. They're also German. Also brought on board was Deke Slayton, former NASA astronaut. Uh, just as an FYI, a lot of old astronauts found their way to private industry, so this isn't, like, weird. Going with an all-solid system had its advantages. Solids uh, are relatively simple boosters to work with. Just turn them on and go. Launch infrastructure is easy, too. Propellants are dense, and ignition is easy. On the downside, all-solid vehicles have different margins than liquid-fueled systems. Once a solid is started, it goes, and the engine underperformance has to be compensated for in the next stage, which is why you usually see liquid kick stages on these types of vehicles. The other benefit, at least for SSI, was having surplus missile parts. Over at Wallops in Virginia, there were old Minuteman 1 stages lying in storage. With some finagling, SSI was able to procure one old Minuteman second stage from NASA for the low price of $340,000. Using existing motors, which we'll see plenty of shortly, meant SSI could save money in research and development. Vehicle design became more of a systems engineering problem than anything else. A year after Percheron, Conestoga 1 stood on the pad at Matagorda Island. The night before launch, Toddy Lee Wynn, SSI's first and most enthusiastic investor, died. The launch was dedicated to him. On the morning of September 9, 1982, at 10.18am, Conestoga 1 launched. The vehicle burned out after 60 seconds of flight. Apogee was 313 kilometers, with a payload of 40 gallons of water. Conestoga 1 was the first private rocket to reach space. Orbit was next. Between 1982 and the actual first orbital launch attempt of Conestoga in 1995, there isn't much I can find about what happened with SSI internally. Instead, we'll look at the various Conestoga families that were proposed. Get ready to learn about solid rocket motors. I should note here that SSI repeatedly used the phrase Model T of space to talk about their plans. SSI was dead set on generating a small commercial satellite market with the Conestoga. Earth observation, navigation, manufacturing prototypes, Leo communications constellations, and science payloads. The logic was sound. Smaller satellites are cheaper to design, build, and fly, so a vehicle like Conestoga could foster a commercial satellite boom. Also, all these vehicles were modular in nature to have a wide range of payloads and missions. There are two contenders for the first Conestoga launch vehicle family. This one is called Conestoga 2. The first stage would be two Castor 4H boosters. I think those are a modified version of the baseline Castor 4? I'm not sure. Castor 4s, by the way, are used on the Delta and Atlas II launchers as boosters. Stage 2 was an altitude-optimized Castor 4H. Stage 3 was a Star 48 motor with the guidance and control module on top. This contained cold gas thrusters for maneuvering and spin-up motors for spin stabilization, if need be. The fourth stage was a Star 30 motor. Overall payload capacity to LEO was to be somewhere around 1,600 pounds or 700 kilograms. Space Vector mentions a range of 200 to 800 kilograms for payloads, which would be greater than the Scout rockets and significantly less than the Shuttle or Ariane launchers also Atlas and Delta. This could toss 274 kilograms to geostationary transfer orbit, too. Gross liftoff weight would be 101.7 thousand pounds, or 46.2 metric tons. On to the next one. This series of Conestogas might have been the first proposed as a successor to the original. There is no mention of Castor 4 motors, instead a launcher built from Scout parts, though technically Scout used casters as well. First stages would be made from Algol 3 motors. Second stages out of half Algol 3s, with upper stages derived from Alcor and Star 20. Conestoga 200, for example, had one Algol 3 first stage, the half Algol 3 second stage, and a 
Uh, I can't read or find any reference to it, but I think that's a Minuteman 1 second stage for the third stage and a Star 20 fourth stage. This could toss something over 400 pounds, 181 kilograms, to low Earth orbit. Conestoga's 300 to 700 made a little more sense. Take the Conestoga 300, three Algol 3s on the first stage, the half Algol second stage, and I think that's either a Star 20 or Alcor upper stage. Uh, it could toss 700 pounds, 317 kilograms, to Leo. Then there's the 400 with four Algol 3 first stages and 900 pounds to Leo. Five had five first stages and 1,100 pounds, 500 kilograms to Leo. The 700, you guessed it, seven first stages and 700 kilograms to Leo. Wait, what motor is that? Next up is a smaller set of LVs. The basis for this family was the Castor 5 booster, a 50 inch diameter successor to the Castor 4. As far as I can tell, that was never built. Three vehicles were proposed, Conestoga 1A, Conestoga 2, and Conestoga 4, with variants included. Conestoga 1A was made up of three stages. Stage 1 was a full-sized Castor 5 booster. Stage 2 was the half-sized Castor 5, and Stage 3 was a Star 37 FM motor. This bad boy could throw less than 1,000 pounds, 400-ish kilograms, to Leo. The Conestoga 2 3-2 was similar to the first, only this one had two Castor 5 strap-on boosters to act as stage zero for the rocket. This one could toss 1,500 pounds, about 680 kilograms, to Leo. The biggest vehicle would be the Conestoga 4, which used four Castor 5s as the first stage, two Castors as the second, the single core Castor as the third, and the half Castor for the fourth. This could toss 4,000 pounds, 1.8 metric tons, to Leo. However, the one we're seeing here was fitted with a Star 37 and Star 27 to act as kick stages to send 575 pounds, 260 kilograms, straight into geosynchronous orbit. Again, modularity. And just for reference, these designs showed up in about 1988. One other thing to note here is the plan for multiple payload deployments, seen in this figure. This is how a lot of small set launchers plan to or already deploy their multiple payloads. Now we're in the home stretch. There are two sets of these Conestogas. You'll see they're virtually identical. Instead of being built from a motor that didn't exist, this family of Conestogas used the Castor 4 motor as the basic building block. Castor 4B would serve as the basic unit used for boosters, with options for Castor 4A as an airlit strap-on motor. The first family goes by Conestoga 2, 3, SSLV, and 4. Ah yes, my favorite number, SSLV. Conestoga 2 would be made of a 2 Castor 4B first stage, 1 Castor 4B second stage, and 1 Star 48B third stage. This bad boy would toss 418 pounds, 190 kilograms, to Leo. Conestoga 3 had 2 Castor 4Bs for the first stage, 2 Castor 4Bs for the second, and 1 for the third, with a Star 48 fourth. This would put 905 pounds, 410 kilograms, into Leo. Conestoga 4 was, shock of all shocks, four Castor 4Bs on the first stage, two on the second, one on the third, with a Star 48B upper stage. 1,573 pounds, or 713.5 kilograms, to Leo. Conestoga SSLV was just a four with a Star 37FM instead of the Star 48B. 1,319 pounds, 598 kilograms, to Leo. One change over the previous versions of Conestoga was the larger hammerhead payload fairing. These would be 65 inches, 1.651 meters in diameter, capable of supporting wider payloads, or more of them. Growth versions were planned using Castor 5C motors instead of the 4Bs. Conestoga 4 would go from 1,573 pounds to nearly 2,600 pounds, or 1,134 kilograms. At some point in 1992, the nomenclature changed from Conestoga 2, 3, and 4 to a more numerical system, kind of like the upcoming Ariane 6. Not much else changed, though. Conestoga 2 became the Conestoga 21048. Two Castor 4s, one Castor 4, and no third stage casters with a Star 48 kick stage. A new Conestoga 31048 was introduced. Three casters on the first stage, you can guess the rest. This one could toss 650 pounds or 295 kilograms to Leo. Conestoga 3 became Conestoga 221-48, since there was another stage with two Castor 4Bs on it, followed by a second stage with two and a third with one. Conestoga 4 then became 
Conestoga 421-48. I should note here that the studies I used for the renders and research also discuss using star 37 upper stages instead of star 48 and the respective payload capacities. I highly recommend reading them not only for the history, but because I can't get all the technical details out. Conestoga had serious and real technical documentation and description compared to something like Percheron, which was mostly one study. By 1993, the Conestoga family had reached the final design. This one would be more modular than the predecessors and include a new payload fairing. The fairing went from one derived from Thor's to one derived from the Pegasus and Taurus launchers. Very rounded, but larger than those two vehicles. You can see it compared to the Delta II fairing here. Now, there was another nomenclature to the family. Conestogas would be followed by a four-digit code, kind of like the Delta II. So we Conestoga WXYZ. The first number would be the type of core and cluster motors. One for Caster 4B slash A, three for the XL variants of Caster 4, and five for using Gem 40s. The second number would be the number of strap-on motors. The third number would be the first upper stage. Zero, none. One, star 37 FM. Two, star 48 V. Three, Orion 50. Four, that doesn't exist, apparently. Five, star 48A. Six, star 63D. Seven, star 63V. Eight, that one also doesn't exist. And nine, HMACS. The fourth number would be the fourth stage, if there was one, with the same numbering system. HMACS was a hydrazine-powered kickstage meant for tweaking the orbit of the payloads. This wasn't built, but Pegasus, Taurus, and Athena had similar systems. Here's the proposed vehicles from the 1993 catalog. Buckle up. Conestoga 1229. Two Castor 4Bs on the first stage, one on the second, a Star 48V upper stage, and it was topped off by an HMAX. 800 pounds, 362 kilograms to low Earth orbit. Conestoga 1379. Three Castor 4B first stage, one second, a star 63 v third and h max on top 1700 pounds 771 kilograms to leo conestoga 1620 the first stage was two caster 4 b's and two caster 4 a's the second two caster 4 b's a single third stage and a star 48 to top it off 2600 pounds 1180 kilograms to leo conestoga 1679 the same arrangement on the first second and third stages Star 63V on the fourth stage with an H max on top. This one could toss 3,300 pounds, 1.5 metric tons, to low Earth orbit. Yes, I ignored the 1669. Star 63D doesn't exist. The 3632, which I failed to render, forgetting that the XL casters were actually built, used six caster 4B and A XLs in the same pattern as the rest of the six clusters did, with an Orion 50 motor and H max for the upper stages. Orion 50, for reference, is used as the Pegasus second stage. This one could throw 4,720 pounds, 2.14 metric tons, to low Earth orbit. One of these would leave the technical papers and schematics of EER and be flown. Also during the 80s, SSI marketed a series of sounding rockets called Starfire. Only a Starfire 1 was launched in 1989. For reference, Starfire is just a Black Brant rocket. In about 1990, EER Systems bought out SSI and reworked Conestoga to what we see launch. All it needed was a payload. Oh look! The Commercial Experiment Transporter, Comet. This was a program run by the University of Tennessee Center for Space Transportation Research, CSTAR. I'm not going to talk much about them, but they were an attempt by NASA to foster commercial space activities, and, and that didn't work. Comet was the biggest of these endeavors, meant to kickstart on-orbit space research by commercial firms. The spacecraft had two main components, a recoverable section and a non-recoverable section. This would launch on a Conestoga 1620 and remain attached to the Star 48 upper stage. After a few weeks, the recoverable section would deorbit and splash down off wallops. The other section would remain on orbit for as long as mission requirements. Both sections could carry a handful of individual commercial experiments. In a way, this feels like a precursor to commercial resupply to the ISS. Depending on the sources, there were at least three to six comet flights planned with the first slated for 1993. Now interestingly, one of those launches was going to have advertisements for the last action hero painted on the side. Arnold Schwarzenegger himself was allegedly going to attend the launch, but the launch got delayed and the last action hero bombed. 
I don't think there's any correlation between the two, but you know. Sea Star got kicked from Comet in 1994-ish, and the project was seized by NASA and renamed Meteor. Another payload, Miniature Sensor Technology Integration 5, was targeted for a Conestoga 1679 launch after the first. October 23rd, 1995, Conestoga 1620. The vehicle launched perfectly into the Virginia sky, but trouble was brewing. Unforeseen vibrations from the engines was messing with the inertial unit, which in turn tried to correct the problem. Solid motors like these use hydraulics to steer the nozzles, but this was too much for them. Hydraulic pressure dropped on motor number six, resulting in a loss of control. At 46 seconds into flight, the flight termination system activated, destroying four of the six caster fours. Two failed to detonate. Meteor and the upper stages plunged in the Atlantic Ocean. After this failure, MSTI-5 was cancelled and EER systems couldn't get enough funding or payloads for another launch. They got out of the rocket business shortly after. Would Conestoga have worked? Oh, that's a tough one. Yes! Aside from teething issues like the guidance system, Conestoga would have most likely worked as an orbital launch vehicle. The solids used had flown before on different launchers. There's nothing new or particularly unique about the vehicle, and it's not trying anything strange. The real issue would have been commercial viability. The late 90s and early 2000s saw the collapse of the satellite market and an overall decline in launches, bottoming it out in 2005-ish. It would have also been competing directly with Pegasus, Taurus, Minotaur, and Athena-1 for a piece of this market. At roughly $12 to $15 million per launch, competition would have been rather steep. With Meteor Comet, it's hard to say if a commercial recoverable science spacecraft would have been successful, perhaps as an add-on to commercial orbital transportation services or as a complement to it. Then there's the evolution of solid systems. Conestoga would have had to have been upgraded to continue using off-the-shelf motors or at least done something to maintain their supply lines. I don't want to get into alternate history territory, so we'll leave it at that. Interestingly, Conestoga might have been a good contender against the current wave of small set launch vehicles, though it might have needed a price reduction. Either way, Conestoga worked. Of the firsts in private space, Conestoga 1 holds one of the highest honors, the first private rocket to reach space. Conestoga 1's successors could have been the first to pave the way to commercial spaceflight. Unfortunately, Pegasus beat it to be the first to orbit, and Conestoga 1620 suffered a crippling launch failure. Then again, we can't put the cart before the horse. Conestoga! That's a rocket you know.